Hi, Dr. Centeno. Sorry I'm running a couple of minutes late. Uh, just a lot going on since I've been back. Trying to Still trying to catch up 100%. I think I'm pretty close, but uh, definitely lots of things, uh, lots of balls in the air. So today, this is really just an Ask Me Anything session. Uh, the goal here is not to give a lecture, uh, but just focus on questions and trying to get uh, all the questions answered. Uh, so just going to be uh, answering questions today. So if you've got questions about regenerative medicine, if you've got questions about craniocervical instability, um, other types of uh, instability or other diagnoses, knee, hip, shoulder, happy to answer any of those questions that you might have. Uh, and so let's see, I'll kind of start out today. Uh, one of the questions that got asked uh, by one of the patients that we saw from Canada this week is in the clinic. Uh, do we um, wear masks? Now, that's an interesting question for someone in the U.S. because we haven't been masked up here now for quite some time. I understood from my Canadian patient that uh, they're still wearing masks in much of Canada, and obviously they are in certain parts of Asia. So uh, interesting issue. Uh, we you know, have had relatively low COVID rates. You have to be vaxxed to work at the clinic. That's a, a one that we don't uh, have any exceptions for, but we're not masked right now. Now, it is possible that sometime this year that'll change as, uh, you know, COVID ticks up as the weather changes. Uh, now, we do have an ultraviolet sterilizer in the air handler. We had that placed way back when in May of 2020. Uh, just to reduce some of the risk of uh, airborne COVID. Uh, but just wanted to make sure I got that out of the way. Uh, let's see, Bethany, uh, let's start with uh, Bethany's question. If a disc replacement is needed only a couple of months after PICL because of severe spinal cord compression, would PICL be for nothing? Or would it be lower the chance of having success with the PICL? You know, Bethany, I, I need to look at your imaging because about 80 or 90% of the time when a patient has been recommended to have a cervical surgery, whether that's an artificial disc replacement or other things, we can help the patient avoid that without the need for the surgery. So it'd be really good to review that with you more in a clinical setting. Uh, now, if you did have to have an ADR surgery, the concern would just be how they have to position you during the surgery. So you'd want to give it a good three or four months after a PICL, so you're well into that remodeling phase, uh, rather than within the first month or two when the ligaments are still healing. Um, or you could do the ADR first, but I'm not sure I'd recommend that because there's a pretty good chance that we can help what's going on at that level without the need for the surgery. Uh, Phil, is there any clinical data showing whether posterior cervical injections help UDS patients with CCI as much as it helps trauma-based patients with CCI? You know, Phil, the only uh, comparison we've done there is for PICL. We have not compared posterior injection results. I can tell you my overall feeling is that there's probably not a huge difference there, but it probably runs similar to uh, the differences that we saw in the PICL procedure. And that is the end outcome is about the same, but it probably takes more procedures to get there. Uh, Mariana, going for my first shot. Great to hear, Mariana. Uh, Stacy, welcome back. Hope your trip was great. If you had several months or several rounds of PRP and three PICLs, but my grab oaks is 10 and compressing my brainstem is a time to go for fusing C1, C2. Now, Stacey, it all comes down to symptoms. So if there's been a substantial symptomatic improvement, the answer is no, meaning that there is no um, reason to get a procedure if uh, symptoms have improved uh, uh, because that's a static measurement and, quote, compressing the brainstem uh, is something we'd have to take a look at, meaning is it touching the brainstem? Is it changing the shape of the brainstem? Uh, and whether or not there's been clinical improvement. So I don't really care as much about changing things like grab oaks, uh, but we're looking for change in dynamic measurements. 
So for instance, uh, a change in an increase in grab oaks with flexion or a change in C1C2 overhang because that indicates better stability. Michelle, if I, have, if I have an SI ligament problem, would it be advisable for me to, to use an SI belt during regenerative healing period? You know, Michelle, it's probably a good idea, especially if you get um, relief from using an SI belt anyway. I think using one um, during the healing period and continuing to use it would be a good idea. Uh, now, if you've never ever used one before and you're not sure if it helps, then my sense is uh, probably don't add one. Uh, but if you really get benefit from one, then yes. Uh, Regenix, made advanced by Michelle. Uh, have you found that Levere scap muscles get involved in the upper cervical stabilization, CCI? I know upper traps, SCM, and scalings do, but also have felt perhaps Levere scaps also do. Yeah, that's a good one. Let's, let's try to look at that a little bit. So let me try to find a good picture to share here. Okay, so let's share that. So you can see here, I'm going to make this a little bigger so you can see it a little better. Um, so this is the levator scapula and levator scapula is muscle that goes from the top of the scapula or shoulder blade. I'm going to try to see if I can move this such that you can see it better. Um, I have a hard time seeing it because of this here. But anyway, I'll try my best to get you to see it better. But bottom line is it goes from the top of the shoulder blade, but you see how it also goes to these upper cervical uh, levels. So you see that there's part of this that goes to the atlas and there's one part that goes to C2. So C1, C2 and C3 are very much a part of levator scapula. So it would make sense that if you had upper cervical instability, levator scapula would jump in there trying to stabilize the upper cervical spine because that's where it attaches. So that makes all sorts of sense. Bethany, okay, so, uh, I see you from our first PSL in three weeks. We discussed at that time. Sure, Bethany, happy to. Regenix, so I'm advanced by Christine. I have an uh, elastic feeling around my head. If I move my eyebrows, you can see my scalp is moving. Don't know if it's related to the CCI. Have you heard about this before? Not sure what you mean by an elastic feeling around the head head. Um, you know, certainly what we have seen is that frontalis muscle can sometimes irritate the small supraorbital nerve up here, and that can lead to some problems. Uh, or more commonly even than that, would be pain in the upper cervical spine, referring to uh, the front of the head area. Um, so but maybe give me a little more information on that so I can sink my teeth into it a little bit more. Uh, Carol Ann Wong, uh, if one has bone on bone ankle OA longstanding, can regenerative procedures help or not good prognosis to the extent of cartilage damage? I've been recommended for a total ankle replacement or fusion. It was injury induced 20 years ago. Yeah, uh, Carol Ann, that's a great question. In general, I think when we're seeing high levels of ankle arthritis, that tends to underperform with a stem cell procedure, meaning results relative to the same amount of knee arthritis. So the same amount of knee arthritis is uh, more likely to do better than the same amount of bone on bone ankle OA. Um, so I think you're down there to about 50, 60% chance of success with bone on bone ankle OA. And we'd probably err more towards culture expanded cells than bone marrow concentrate to try to get that uh, number up there a bit. Um, so that's that's kind of how that goes. Different than knee osteoarthritis where having bone on bone usually isn't a problem. Uh, Bethany, I have developed numb palate, tongue and throat over the past few months after my CCI symptoms started. Have you heard of this before? Is it connected with CCI and or TMJ affecting the trigeminal vagus and glossopharyngeal cranial nerves? 
Yeah, so uh, just in front of that C1-C2 area, there's a lot going on there. There's the internal jugular vein, there's the glossopharyngeal nerve, there's the vagus nerve. So um, certainly we can see issues with uh, the back of the throat. Now the tongue, uh, there's also a plexus there that I described in another video that um, is very interesting because uh, the 12th cranial nerve comes through that plexus and that's the the tongue. Um, and then trigeminal isn't located directly there, but again, goes through that plexus. So all of that sounds like an irritation of this new plexus that was just discovered not too long ago due to instability. And uh, it's on a past video. Uh, let's see if it's possible to find that blog for you. I'm not sure I blogged on it, but I got about 3,000 blogs, so it's, here it is. No, that's not it. My bad. Uh, it's definitely, look on the YouTube channel, and I would type in cervical plexus, um, and it'll probably come up. So, sorry, I can't find that for you right now. Uh Stacy, if I fuse C1C2, does that preclude me from tuning posterior PRP for walking curve at mid to low spine? Definitely makes it harder because um, uh, you'll be fused into a specific position and making changes in the curve at that point is probably going to be more difficult. But listen, if you got to do it, you got to do it. Barbara, how often do you have patients that have trauma-related CCI, also have concussion or other traumatic brain injury, and does treating the CCI also heal the brain. Uh, Barbara probably doesn't heal the brain, but there's a big crossover with brain fog, uh, which is present in mild traumatic brain injury and uh, brain fog caused by CCI. So we will see cognition improve related to a lifting of that brain fog in a lot of patients. Uh, so it just depends on what the brain fog is being caused by. But PRP times three or five years ago, no help. Oh, uh, I think you're talking about your ankle. Yeah, uh, that's too severe for PRP. Um, so if it was like that uh, a number of years ago, PRP would be less likely to help something like that. Just just letting you know. Um, so in advanced by Jimmy O'Neill. Uh, I reacted well to prolabal OC2 in the past, but I developed deep somatic pain in my back, neck, cervical thoracic this past year. Their flares up pretty bad with even light physio. Have you had any patients with this issue? Uh, I'd be traveling to see you, so I want, uh, want to be somewhat aggressive, but worry about the following pain. Um, we certainly see a lot of patients with cervical and thoracic um, pain caused by lots of different things, facet joint injuries, rib problems, uh, cervical disc bulges, thoracic disc bulges, et cetera. Um, as far as being aggressive goes, normally that's a platelet-based procedure, so really not too hard to recover from in most patients. Uh, Edward, hydroxyl tendon on four months, uh, complex PSL number one. Unfortunately, I'm yet to feel any symptomatic relief. What percentage of the seven out of 10 that feel symptomatic relief feel that improvement after four months is appropriate to consider that the procedure has failed concerning I'm 18. You know, Edward, I think when we're in that place, so the answer to the first question, um, it is, uh, we would expect to see changes by four months in the vast majority of patients. Now, it's certainly possible that we uh, didn't tighten it down enough with the first one to see symptomatic relief. And I think it's talked about in the Facebook group, at least people have told me here on this um, channel, that uh, it's often talked about that sometimes you need two or three of these to really see something. But we're in this place, we redo the DMX. That's why we're so focused on DMX and having numbers that we can follow to try to make sure that there's been an improvement in instability. If there has been an improvement in instability, then we can move forward with number two, knowing that we've done something and that we're heading in the right direction. If there hasn't been, that that's obviously a different conversation. On your high tenno, if the dens is potentially hitting the brainstem, can PSE help with that? Or should I get value for surgery? 
what scan can diagnose brainstem compression, upright MRI. You know, Anya, as I just said, I'm not concerned at all about the DENS touching the brainstem. Um, that's a super common thing we see in lots and lots of patients. The real question is, is there instability, meaning are things moving around too much? So as an example, when the person goes into flexion, does the DENS flip backwards and cause more issues? And so the goal there is to uh, reduce that instability. Same thing with uh, C1, C2 or atlanoaxial overhang instability. Uh, we want to try to get that better. So not so concerned about how things look on MRI and how they're positioned. Um, in most instances, uh, it's just looking at whether or not they're stable. If they're stable, usually there's not a big deal. Um, so I want you to stop thinking like some of the surgeons do here, that just because something is this way or that way or the angle of the dangle or the squiggle, the wiggle doesn't look right, that you need surgery. The real issue is instability. And you wanna, if it's there, you wanna make it stable and then hopefully the symptoms go away. Now, for some people, uh, they still may need to get surgery, um, but I'm not so concerned about the DENS uh, touching the brainstem. It's more the instability that's concerning. It's been advanced by Christine. Um, I have CCIA, I and EDS. I'm struggling with so much pressure on my head behind eyes and sinuses. Sometimes I rot my head, rotate my head or lay on my side. I get pressure. Sometimes I can also feel the pulse in my neck and brain and throat. And I've read a little about vascular compression. I'm confused uh, because if I got fixed my CCI, some people say that it can be better. And some people say that you can have both. Uh, and if you fix the ICCI, you should still have vein uh, I'm, I'm assuming the next word is going to be decompression. So, uh, Christine, I think the best thing to do, and I may have already pointed you in this direction, but let me find this. Um, then I'll share it once I find it, uh, just so that you can read this. Okay, let's try to share that. So, Christine, this is the blog uh, that covers all of this. And, you know, you need to be careful with the Facebook social media groups on this stuff, because what I've found is, is that we have these ideas that tend to promulgate without much science behind them or even common sense. So one of the things that this article brings up, and it's critical that you read it, is that, yes, you can see things like internal jugular vein compression due to the instability. And then obviously the goal would be to reduce the instability. And we do that by trying to tighten down the ligaments or obviously much more invasively surgery. Um, but so this is a good one to read. There's also another one that I want you to read. So, uh, and hopefully I can move that where you can, uh, it's not really working there. Anyway, so if you go to the Regenix site, uh, type in the blog and just type in uh, jugular vein, both of these will come up and it's this one uh, because this one goes through uh, the research showing um, that internal jugular vein compression is super common in patients who don't have problems. Uh, so in the studies that have been done, these are the symptoms of internal jugular vein uh, compression, uh, the most common symptoms. So if you look at these, you can see, and the size here matters because it's the amount of complaints these patients had, meaning more had insomnia and tinnitus or ringing in the ears and head noises, and fewer had things like hearing impairment, neck pain, and headache. So those are the symptoms uh, when it's symptomatic. Um, but you know this is incredibly important stuff right here because it talks about that about a third of people out there just walking around who have no problems and no symptoms have internal moderate internal jugular vein compression. And it's not until we see severe bilateral compression that we get to a low enough number, 9.3% of normals, 
that there's a 90% chance or 91% chance that we're dealing with something that's probably abnormal. Um, so we need to be really careful just because we even see severe stenosis, which is this number on one side. So on the right side, one in four, one in four people are walking around out there with internal adrenal vein stenosis on the right side who are totally normal and they, will, they don't need that treated at all. Uh, and when it comes to the left side, severe stenosis was found in about one in five patients. So be really, really careful when you, you hear people on social media telling you, you need to get that decompressed. You don't need to get it decompressed if it's not causing you any symptoms because it's very common in normal patients who have no problems. And again, this is the rate of if I walk on the street right now and pick some random person who's older like me and I just tap them on the back and I say, hey, come into my office. Let's do an internal jugular vein scan. They've got no problems, no issues in life. They're not a CCI patient. These are the percentages of positive compression of that internal jugular vein. So be really, really careful when you hear stuff like that, because that's not accurate at all. Uh, Liam, how many months after first PICL is good repeat DMX? You know, four months is usually where we try to do it. So we like to wait at least four months, Liam. Uh, Faction. I have a left side process of 26 millimeters, uh, and I feel usually a click in my left jaw when I open my jaws. I also lose consciousness, I think, if I turn my body on my left side in bed or maybe turn onto your left side in bed. How do you know if styloid is an issue or just see what rotation? Yeah, it's not a, uh, a styloid of 26 millimeters. It's the stylohyoid ligament. Um, so that's completely different. Um, so now that we're here, there's a blog that I have called What is Eagle Syndrome? And this is a good one for you to read. So again, if you go to the Regenix blog, type in Eagle Syndrome, this one will come up. And so this is how it looks here. We've got the styloid process way up here. And then we have this stylohyoid ligament and stylomandibular ligament. Now, the stylomandibular ligament is linked to your jaw. So it, it might click when you open your jaw. Um, and the stylohyoid muscle uh, and ligament go all the way down to the hyoid sling down here. Um, so just realize that you've got muscles that attach to that styloid process and ligaments. And the ligaments can get calcified, making this appear longer. Now, the problem is we have no study that anyone can do that will show that this is causing your symptoms. Literally, what we have to do is do a very invasive surgery to cut all of this, further destabilizing your neck in order to see if that was causing your symptoms. So obviously, it makes much, much more sense to pursue injection-based treatments, which are far less invasive, compared to cutting these ligaments, causing more instability in the neck and someone who already has instability in the neck. Um, so again, you may or may not need it treated, but there is no uh, surefire test that can be formed showing that that's a problem causing your symptoms until we cut it. Uh, Kimberly, is fatigue a common dominant symptom of CCI? And do you see that simply improve after CCI treatment? Yeah, you know, you are in luck because we studied all that. Let's pull that up. So, guys, as you're probably getting the idea, if you want to find stuff, either look at the YouTube channel or the blog, because that's where a lot of this stuff lives. And then obviously the book is another big one uh, to read because a lot of that's in here. A lot of this is in here and the book kind of tries to summarize it all. So these are the symptoms of about 100 patients, 101, I think who we knew had CCI and we asked them to list their symptoms and then we grouped them this way. The larger the word, the more commonly that symptom was reported. So you can see the two biggest words are headache, dizziness, lightheadedness. So that was the, the most predominant thing reported. And then if we look at the size here of these words, then the next ones down are neck pain, numbness, tingling, 
and fatigue is right in there uh, and shoulder pain and brain fog. So those are kind of in that same category. So yeah, fatigue is a pretty common one uh, that's reported. Now, it's usually not the predominant symptom. And if it's the only predominant symptom, then you know we're probably going to be much less certain that CCI is causing your symptoms. Uh, but as sort of a, a, a symptom that gets reported pretty commonly, it's definitely up there. I uh, just want to say thank you for all you're doing. These live Q&As, your time and advice is invaluable. I've learned about CBP from you, which is helping my posture recover further after two posterior PRP injections of algo cells. Oh, thank you, Phil. Yeah, you know, as you know, uh, I have a passion for this stuff, and my goal is to try to make sure that people understand what's going on. And um, to the extent that I'm able to do these, I'm happy to do them. Uh, I think, like I said, Last time, um, I'm going to be going down to Grand Cayman for two weeks to uh, to see patients at our uh, licensed advanced culture site down there. And so I don't know that I'll be able to do this for the next two weeks, but I'm going to try. I may get one or two in over the next two weeks, or maybe I'll do it like I did before, source questions, and then maybe early in the morning answer some questions and do a video like that. But thank you for, for uh, your kind words. Regenex, been advanced by Ravati. Uh, can denervation atrophy be fixed? Um, it depends on what's caused the denervation. So if what caused the denervation is something like radiofrequency ablation, I think it's less likely. Um, now, if what caused the denervation was just irritated nerves, I think it's more likely once the irritated nerves are treated. But uh, denervation atrophy caused by a damaged nerve and one that's dead, like radiofrequency ablation, is going to be much, much harder to treat. Uh, Kimberly, if someone is traveling, flying to see you for treatment, how long do you recommend staying to recover? You always tell patients that if it's their first PICL uh, and they're uh, local, they want to stay out here one or two days, meaning they're in the U.S. Um, and uh, so that's in the U.S., domestic, let's say, not local. And if they are traveling internationally, you'd want to stay more, at least three to four days. And the goal there for the first time is just that we can see how you respond. And if we need to see you back in the clinic to check something, we can do that. Um, now, once we get a sense of how you respond, you can shorten that time, especially if you're in that patient population where this is really not a big deal. You have some soreness, but no, no harm, no foul. But if you're in the other patient population of someone who's what I call a fragile egg and you're going to have a major flare up, then you'd want to continue to stay longer so that we have the opportunity to assist you or see you back in the clinic and hydrate you, et cetera. Michelle, should shoulder muscles try to stabilize neck? Does that tend to cause dysfunctional shoulder function? Um, I think what we tend to see more is scalenes there bridging that gap between what's happening in the shoulder and the neck. Um, now, what we can see is patients who have undiagnosed AC joint instability or sternoclavicular joint instability, and we see that a lot, uh, and that then wreaks havoc with the neck. Uh, Monsef, pl please can you help? It's been four weeks that I have been feeling of instability. I've done MRI and found that I have C6, 7 herniated smaller ones from C3 to C6. Um, yeah, Monsef, so the most common cause of feeling if there's instability in the neck would be that the muscles are turned off, the stabilizing muscles, the deep stabilizing muscles, and that's leading to um, less active stability, so it feels unstable. Uh, so the way to treat that is to calm down the irritated nerves. Now, if conservative care hasn't worked, then there are injections we can do using your own platelets uh, to help that. But that's generally why that happens. Uh, Monsef, now whenever I walk, I feel unstable. Also looking from top to down as I feel as if there's an electric shock. Sometimes when I'm in bed, feel pulse amplified in my ear. Uh, so Monsef, I think I would need to know um, where you're feeling the electric shock. That might give me some clues as to where the issues could be. Uh, Monsef, again, my doctor said the upper cervical do not have a problem. Can a herniated disc from C3 to C7 give this feeling of instability? It certainly can because, again, the small stabilizing muscles, when the nerves get irritated, go offline. Uh, those are called multifidus. Um, 
in the neck and the back. As far as whether or not the upper cervical has a problem, uh, regrettably, we're not going to see that on routine MRI imaging, so we don't really know that one yet, but that would be less likely that you have an upper cervical problem, um, but it's possible. We advise against using TFC post PICL. Does TFC negatively impact the long-term stem cell healing process? I was a light user, but quit two months ago for the anesthesia risk. I'm wondering if it's best to stay off long-term. Yeah, Liam, we have some early mesenchymal stem cell research showing that THC did impact the ability of uh, bone marrow mesenchymal stem cells to differentiate. Um, and uh, but there hasn't been a lot published on this. The bigger issue, I think, with THC is that it, it really makes anesthesia much more difficult and much more risky. And we need anesthesia for these procedures. As far as going back on it afterwards, um, you know, if you had a choice between narcotics and THC, I'd rather you're on THC, frankly. Um, but if we can find other medications that aren't as noxious as narcotics that might help, then that that's good, too. But just realize if you stay on it prior to a procedure, it does mess with the anesthesia. Uh, Jennifer, um, how far ahead of the procedure should herbal pain relievers be stopped? Uh, a lot depends on which herbal pain relievers, but I think if you want to be safe, uh, I'd give it two weeks. Uh, Liam, should alcohol be avoided entirely post PICL with over glass of red wine? You know, Liam, not a big problem. When we're talking about alcohol and stem cells, it's really the higher alcohol users. So once you get into two, three, four glasses, and you're moving away from social alcohol drinking of a glass of red wine a night into higher levels of consumption, then that can affect stem cells. But a glass of red wine a night, I'm not going to really worry about. Christine, what I mean by elastic feeling is that it feels like I have an elastic or I have elastic around my skull, like a tightness there goes from my face to the end of my skull. And if I move my eyebrow, you can see my whole skull moving because it's so tight. Um, yeah, that just could be tightness in the frontalis muscle there. Um, and, you know, what's causing that is a good question. Um, let's see. If we've got some good pictures here uh, to talk about how that works. Um, this is probably a pretty good one. So this, uh, what's interesting here, and one that's not talked about a lot, is this frontalis muscle, which is above the um, eyes here, connects into what we call an aponeurosis, which basically is like a big tendon that also connects into these uh, muscles back here in the upper cervical spine. So if you've got CCI, you can also feel issues in that frontalis muscle because this yanks on the big tendon, which yanks on that, or this is jumping in to try to help stabilize what's happening back here. So it's all connected. Now, it doesn't mean you have CCI at all. It just means that if you do, there could be some crosstalk between the front and the back. Phil, of the 70% that get improvement with PICL, what portion get a full recovery or very close to full? full. You know, I feel that really depends on how, where the patients are. So I think as I've always said that the deeper the hole, the harder that hole is to climb out of. So what that means is that we have patients who are not all that disabled or are relatively acute. Let me give you, you know, a tale of two different patients, actually three patients here. Um, two of these patients are actually, uh, uh, some young doctors uh, who had reached out to me and they knew what kind of work I did. And so they were very concerned that after a traumatic injury, they could have CCI. So we did the workup. They did have CCI. All the symptoms fit. The car crash fit. Um, and But it hadn't been going on that long, three or six months for both of them. They're relatively young people. And, you know, they were still working, but they were struggling. Um, so both of them made up pretty much a full recovery, 80, 90% after a single procedure and decided not to do anything more. Um, now compare that to a Canadian, uh, another uh, medical provider, this was a chiropractor, 
who would spend 23 hours a day laying down, only four 15-minute shifts being upright. Well, we were able to flip that. So he only had to lay down four 15-minute shifts a day and was upright during the day. Now, is he back to 100% normal? No, but that's a huge functional improvement for him because he went from totally non-functional human to a more functional human. So just use those kinds of things as your guide. It's been advanced by Harry uh, Winston. Have you seen a systemic connection between CCI and people who have had long-term neck issues like torticollis? You know, it's interesting, Harry. Um, I wouldn't have thought so, but it was about six months or a year ago that I was doing some research on torticollis. And um, over the last couple of years, it seems like the torticollis research community has centered on this being a C1C2 joint issue. Um, and so I found that pretty interesting. So there probably is some crossover between those two. And you may want to read, just type in uh, torticollis and C1C2, because there's been a lot of research published on that in the last five years. So it, it kind of surprised me that they were all centering there. It makes total sense because C1C2 uh, is where we get 50% of our neck rotation from. And these sternocleidomastoid muscles frequently involved in torticollis are the ones that freak out. So this muscle works hand in glove with the C1C2 joint. You got a C1C2 joint problem, you get a problem with this muscle, sternocleidomastoid. Edward, my main problem is ADI 4.5, whereas marble hangs are minimal. Instead of repeating DMX, see if ADI proof of PSCL is flexion x-ray with full range of motion sufficient. Um, yeah, not so much, meaning that um, it, when we're doing a DMX, it's a different thing because the patient has to move that direction, stop themselves, then go backwards in the other direction. And that's very different than a static flexion or extension image. So I'm not sure I'd trust comparing a DMX to a flexion extension image. Uh, Bethany, if an area of cervical disc bulge is also as bone spurs of both sides and pressing on the spinal cord, is it harder to address than any treatment you can provide? You know, Bethany, it all really depends on what it looks like on imaging. Um, uh, I'm a great example of that. Um, I, oh God. I'm trying to think how many years it was, maybe six or seven at this point. Um, had severe cervical radiculopathy, um, was struggling to work. Uh, I have very little, I've got cervical stenosis, multiple disc bulges, multiple osteophytes. Um, and looking at my cervical MRI, you would think I would need surgery. Um, never got the surgery. We treated it. Um, haven't had any. Every couple of years, I'll get an update on it. Um, but that's all I needed. Um, you know, the problem with surgery is it's always damage to accomplish a goal. There's no elegant way to do a disc replacement. We're always going to damage your spine in order to try to accomplish the goal of increasing disc height and uh, reducing the size of the bulge. Um, and you may want to look at uh, this one. This is an engineer, I believe, from California. California. Let's see here. I don't know if I use the term engineer, but I'm going to try. Uh, there's 3,000 blogs here, so it's often not easy to find them. I think this is it. Yeah. Uh, so here's our guy here. Um, and it's kind of small, but I'm not sure if you can see that, but he's got a large 5.6 disc bulge, cervical stenosis. It's all pressing into his uh, spinal cord. Um, uh, the problem is that when we look at those images, um, we're only looking at a very small part of the story, um, meaning that the story that causes pain is mechanical, which is what we're talking about there some irritation of the spinal cord, but then there's also a, a very big chemical component, meaning there are people with you know, MRIs just like yours who don't have any pain at all. They've never had any pain. They never will have any pain because the chemical environment is healthy. And then there's, there's also the amount of nerve irritation that's happening there or the health of the nerve. And again, we have people walking around with MRIs just like yours who have zero pain at all. 
And so uh, this guy, I think we've treated him two or three times, maybe um, back to riding his bike, back to doing everything at Stanford or some other fancy place out there. They had told him his only option was a cervical fusion or artificial disc replacement. Never got one. Gotcha. I've heard the term capsular ligaments and they stabilize the facet joint. Should these ligaments be injected together with the LR transverse for better outcome or are they injected with posterior injection only? Um, anytime we do a post or a, a PSEL, we're doing posterior injections as, as well. Um, if the capsular ligaments need to be injected, they can be injected. Realize they're not major stabilizers of the joint um, and they get incompetent in everyone as we get older. So you know, if you've got any age on you, uh, past 40, 45, 50, then the capsular ligaments, even if you don't have any neck pain, are probably pretty loose. Uh, Fatchen, I've heard the term cranial settling. I think the head, signing an atlas or similar, is this something that can be still addressed by tightening the damaged ligaments in the CCJ? Yeah, Fatchen, cranial settling is, again, that issue uh, of structure. I'm not concerned about structure only concerned about instability. Um, so cranial settling would mean that the head uh, tends to sit lower on the neck and uh, not a problem if uh, there isn't any instability. So again, not so concerned about the structure or the angle of the dangle or the squiggle of the wiggle, um, but concerned about if things are moving around too much as you move. Kelly, can a bulging C5 that touches the spinal cord cause unsteadiness? Vertigo of a stillbirth testing is negative. Brain is fine on imaging. Uh, much, much less commonly. So that's usually, if it's coming from the neck, an upper cervical issue. Uh, C0, C1, C1, C2, C2, C3. Um, you know, I would go and read the CCI book because that'll give you a lot more information. Uh, let me see if I can find you the CCI book here. So this is now the Centeno Schultz website. I've moved from the Regenix uh, site to the Centeno Schultz website. Yeah, so if you go to the Centeno Schultz website, go to the to the specialty area, uh, go to craniocervical instability. Uh, you can download this book and it'll answer a lot of those uh, questions. But uh, just to answer your question now, uh, we're talking about upper cervical spine if it's coming from your neck, leading to those sorts of symptoms, symptoms of unsteadiness and vertigo. The C5-6 or C4-5 area, not so much. Uh, we are so many people in you who want your treatment. Can you open a clinic here? You know, what we do, Christine, is so specialized. The answer is uh, no time soon. Um, the problem is the level and degree of training in uh, what it is we do, even for something as simple as a C0, C1 facet injection, would take way, way too long to make it practical for somebody um, in Europe to learn this stuff. Um, so the answer is no, and there are real reasons regarding risk why the answer is no. Anya, thank you. My right MRI with lateral bending shows overhang. I partially lose eyesight and hearing, plus my blood pressure falls when I look up. Also constant headache and deep pain in C1 area. Uh, Anya, and the worsening of these symptoms during neck rotation. Can this be caused by brainstem compression or is artery compression more likely? Can the dens compress an artery when I look up as an example? Um, so yes, we have seen that happen. The, well, not so much the dens, but realize if we look at the vertebral artery, let's see if we can find some good pictures for you here. Uh, yeah. That's a good one. Um, that's also a good one. So uh, let me see if I can just copy and paste this to make this a little bigger because it's not so big there. And it looks like the image will look much better if we do that. 
Um, so let's stop that. Let's go. Huh, quite sure why I'm not. See, I'll just go to the entire screen. Okay, so the vertebral artery uh, goes through this area. So it's this red thing here. It goes through a little hole in the C2 bone, and it goes through a hole called the arcuate foramen in the C1 bone. And then it goes towards the inside and then goes up into the brain area. Uh, so it can get pinched when the person looks up if there's instability or if the patient rotates their head uh, and there's instability. Um, in addition to that, there are other mechanisms like irritation of a nerve plexus around the vertebral artery without frank compression that can probably lead to issues as well. Um, also could be issues with the vagus nerve in the front. Uh, GL Charlie, thank you for your insight, Dr. Steno. How much do you charge for one PRP injection of cervical facet joints, stem cells, BICL procedure? What type of stem cells do you use? Uh, let's see. As far as the amount we charge, that depends on what we do. Uh, but usually on the order of several thousand dollars for posterior PRP injections when it comes to PICL procedure or more. Uh, again, all depends on what it is we're doing. Uh, and we only use the, the only type of stem cells we're allowed to use here in the United States and that are real are those coming from your bone marrow. Um, anything that you hear about someone using umbilical cord stem cells, uh, that's fraud. We, we've we done that research, uh, published it in the world's most prestigious orthopedic journal, I think two years ago. Um, so that's what we use. Uh, and that give you some idea, but contact Carla. Um, uh, she can give you a better idea. But the best thing to do is to do a telemedicine eval so we can figure out whether or not you're even a candidate for something like this. Uh, Kimberly, I listened to your talk in terms of your vein. Excellent. I had Prolo four rounds in 2015, uh, C2 through C7, really up to four star injections. I passed out when I got home. And right after several months, had severe tinnitus and weird swishing in my head that I would describe as a beach wave crashing noise in my head. No longer have that wishing, but wanted to ask your thoughts on this. Yeah, Kim, one of the problems that we see is that when someone's doing blind prolotherapy, there's a lot of stuff that can get hit. In fact, we just looked at that vertebral artery. The vertebral artery can get hit um, and um, you can hit, you know, small nerves, et cetera. So that's why we don't recommend blind, blind prolotherapy, especially in this upper cervical area, because there's so much important stuff up there. Um, so, uh, and, and I'll give you an even worse example. There was a patient we heard about this week who was uh, seen by an experienced interventional spine provider um, who injected some PRP. And, uh, pr you know, who knows yet what happened, but probably given the description, an injection directly into the vertebral artery. Um, and uh, that person woke up hemiplegic, meaning they had a, a brainstem stroke, it seems like. Again, there's still more to know about this particular case, um, but that would be the leading hypothesis right now. Uh, and which is why I always push people to come to Centennial Schultz to get these done, because, you know, even experienced interventional spine providers may have only done these procedures like C zero C1 facet injections a few dozen times. Mastery is not at a few dozen times. I don't care who you are, whether you're a doctor or a guitar player. It takes hundreds and thousands of times to get to mastery. So we've done those procedures thousands of times, but that's a very real uh, example, uh, even with an experienced interventional spine provider, that there can be problems when doing these procedures. Um, and you got to get them done by someone that's done it thousands of times. Uh, because there's so much difference in anatomy from person to person, someone who's got digital subtraction and geography to make sure they're not in the artery, and uh, uh, someone who has done this enough where they can sort of see when they're starting to get in trouble. And, you know, there are times when we just abandon. We say, you know what, this one, maybe it's one in 100, can't be done safely, and far better to abandon it. Uh, because you know it's not possible to do because you've done thousands of them 
than risk injecting into that vertebral artery. Ulysses, uh, how do you cervical instability or how do you cervical instability can affect the whole spine down if left untreated between? Um, yeah, so uh, how can uh, cervical instability affect the whole spine? Uh, we know that patients with the chronic neck pain start to lose uh, lumbar or low back stability. That's the transverse abdominis muscle, and it tends to go offline. So then that can lead to back pain. That's one mechanism. And guys, I do have a hard stop here in the next few minutes. So I'm going to try my best to get to as many uh, questions as I can. Uh, if I don't get to your question, then please, um, uh, Carol should be able to carry that over to the next Facebook Live. Um, and she'll copy and paste those. Um, uh, so just, you know, don't, don't fear. We'll, we'll get to it at some point. Uh, Jill Charlie, does Woodland Hills, Cairo, and Tanzania provide good quality of motion x-rays uh, for your patient consultation? Yeah, pretty good. I mean, those are the, that's one of the ones we use, and we tend to get good stuff. Thanks, FCCI. And the last stick started off with my bad movement. My dizziness is so bad. I feel like I'm losing stability in my body. I, even have neck collar, I felt like I'm on a boat. Everything feels like I'm losing connection to the ground. Really difficult to explain. But do you have many patients where they barely could sit because of heavy head and dizziness? Yeah, so that's not uncommon, but realize that the longer that goes on and the more disabled you become, the harder it is to get back to normal. So that's that's an important thing to realize. Uh, Edward, do we know what's happening in patients whose DMX doesn't change at four months if they don't have some underlying illness like MCAS or EDS? Do some people just not respond to stem cells for whatever reason? Sure. I mean, there is no 100% chance of recovery with any procedure and certainly not with this one. So that would put that person in that three out of 10 that just don't seem to respond. Uh, what's the reason for that? Uh, could be that there's too much damage for stem cells to handle or really bone marrow concentrate. Could also be that uh, for whatever reason, there's some problem with function of those cells. Uh, total body inflammation is too high, uh, et cetera. Christine, when can you... You only lay on your back in bed and not side. Yeah, that's too uh, hard to interpret, Christine. I, I can't uh, get into that one in too much detail right now because I'm, I'm sort of winding this up. Peter, I worsened after a nerve ablation at C2 to C4, getting new pain, worse dizziness. How long will it take for nerve muscles to heal from it? Yeah, Peter, that's why we never recommend radio frequency ablation for any of our patients. And I want to make sure I'm very clear on this because I had a patient that did this and then was surprised when uh, things didn't work, uh, claiming that I didn't discuss this with them. So I'm discussing it now. I've discussed it lots of times on Facebook Live. Um, and we've since put it into our paperwork as well. If you get a nerve ablation, you're killing off the muscles that stabilize your neck. If you then have instability, it's going to make the instability worse. Will those muscles come back to normal? We don't know. Uh, and so I don't know at least six to 12 months, but probably longer because radio frequency ablation pain wise usually lasts one to two years when it's effective. So it takes at least that long for these nerves to regrow. Um, so I hate to tell you that. But uh, I want to make sure that I'm very clear on that. If you've got a, if you do a radio frequency ablation, you're going to reduce the chance that the stuff we do will help. Now, I'm not saying we can't help, but I want to make sure that everyone hears that loud and clear because one patient claimed that she had never heard that before, despite the fact that I've talked about it quite a lot here. Uh, Joanna, how recent should DMX be for scheduling consultation? last six to 12 months, if nothing's changed, maybe we can go one to two years, but that'd be max. Uh, Thatchen, uh, 3D rotation, uh, CT of the CCJ is also mentioned as a diagnostic tool for CCI and lack of DMX upper, upright MRI. Um, yeah, I mean, the problem is it doesn't have as much literature behind it, and it's not going to be as uh, likely to show CCI if it's there. Can we look at it and, and it might show CCI? Happy to look at it to see if it shows CCI. 
It does seem like a fan of RFA. My liquid protection provider recommended that I go ahead and do RFA at C2 to C4 before my PRP a couple of years ago. Yeah, Jennifer, that's why you shouldn't be going to any other Regenix clinic for an upper cervical problem. And I, I want to make sure I stress this. The only clinic that has experience in treating upper cervical spine is Centeno Schultz, period. End of story. So uh, should not be going to another clinic at this point if you've got an upper cervical problem. And it's stuff like that that's hard to teach. Um, so that might be a great Regenix clinic that may do all sorts of great things. But recommending an RFA for a cervical instability patient is contraindicated. Uh, Christine, has young people better chances to heal? What is young? I don't know that we see that in the data, but it certainly helps to be young in a lot of different ways. Um, so what is young? Someone who's under 30, 35. Can a DMX become too outdated? Yeah, we wouldn't want to see one more than a year or two old. Uh, oh, maybe that was before. Um, okay, guys, let me answer this last one because I do have a hard stop here and I'm already late for the next meeting that I have. Um, is fluoroscopy your sign better for injections? Uh, depends on what kind of injections, Megan, if we're injecting any deep structures, fluoroscopy always trumps ultrasound uh, as far as adding additional patient safety. Uh, if all we're doing is superficial injections, like just into these way back ligaments, supraspinous, interspinous, then ultrasound, that can be done safely. Um, okay, guys, I do have to wrap, wrap this up. Like I said, uh, this coming uh, Monday, I don't think I'm going to be here, but I'm going to try while I'm down in Grand Cayman to do at least one or two of these, whether that's recorded questions like I did while I was in Europe. We'll have to see how that schedule goes because I'm going to be pretty busy when I'm down there. So thanks so much for watching. Again, an educated patient is a happier patient, is a patient that gets better quicker. Um, if I didn't get your question, then uh, please leave it here and throw down as many as you want, because uh, hopefully we can get Carol to uh, take those questions and uh, put them on to the next one of these uh, events. So thanks so much for watching and, and have a great day.